and of course my favourite artefact is the ship's hull, the ship itself, the large artefact which sat on the bottom. Uh, it appeared to be in particularly good condition, uh, but you could actually just put your thumb straight through that. So it's the cells of the wood uh, maintain quite a good, good uh, condition, but the interior just goes to mush. It's just uh, replaced by salt water. It is feasible to do sort of a restoration, to do preservation of underwater waterlogged timbers, but it's an extremely long and expensive process. The Mary Rose, for example, uh, has been preserved. That took probably, I think it was 10 years, a decade of constant uh, showering with a micro crystalline wax heated up and uh, after the event it was beautifully displayed but now we found or they the archaeologists and the curators have found that the iron nails have reacted with that wax and are starting to degrade the timbers further so they have to look at reversing that process which is feasible but it's a, it's a mammoth undertaking and unfortunately there was no funding available through the private enterprise that did this wreck and certainly Indonesia wasn't going to be funding that so the shipwreck remained on, si in site, on site, it was buried, uh, and unfortunately after we left the site, uh, all of that magnificent hull remains were dug up by the Indonesian fishermen divers, the same guys that were looting during the monsoon period, the same guys that started looting immediately after finding it, uh, because when these wrecks first occur there's a little bit of scouring, so one or two bowls get tucked underneath the hull. So all the hull gets ripped up just to find a few intact pieces underneath. Uh, as a, another aside, one of UNESCO's primary uh, suggestions, to use the word mildly, is to leave shipwrecks in situ for future generations to come and excavate when there's uh, a better technology. Clearly in Southeast Asia at this stage that's not a viable system. Anyway, uh, Ninth century, so I get down here and I, I suspected when I heard about all the cargo, I knew it was ninth century. I thought, wow, this is going to be a very early example of a Chinese junk, which John pointed out are not known otherwise to have been leaving the shores of China until the 11th or 12th century. Uh, more possible was the fact that it was a Southeast Asian vessel. They were voyaging from the first century, maybe before, had got as far as Madagascar in the seventh century. Uh, so it was a very good chance it was a lash lug vessel of Indonesian, Malay, Philippine origin. Uh, but when I saw this, there are the holes along the edge of the planks which some of the lash, lash lug vessels had. They actually did stitching inside the hull. But these holes went all the way through and the hull planks were very thin, uh, only four or five centimeters thick. Uh, and there were no lugs on them. The Indonesian uh, planks were actually carved out of trees and you could only carve perhaps two planks from one tree and there were big lugs incorporated in the plank and to those they had the frames, these are frames here but very very small, the frames on the Indonesian craft would go across those lugs, they'd be lashed onto them with uh, rattan or kwa, coconut fiber. Uh, this one was actually lashed with coconut fiber um, but they had big piles of wadding inside and out underneath the lashing they had these things which I've called ceiling planks. It's a term that actually on European ships, other, other term would be a cargo tray. So they were put on top of the frames and the cargo was placed on top of those planks. Uh, and you can actually see where some of the ceramics were, were lying. That's the impression of a bowl that was lying on the, the planking. Uh, the stitching in this case is actually rotted away, but we did find many other examples of the surviving stitching. Uh, this is the very bow of the vessel. It's the keel. Uh, it's very, very fine. This is only 14 centimeters across. Tiny. For the ship itself was about 23 meters from memory, the keel length, 25 meters. Uh, so it's an extremely fine uh, size for the, the vessel. That you can see the shape there. They've carved it. And this is a, a drawing of what it would have looked like originally with all the stitching. There's not a single dowel joint, there's not a single iron fastening, there's no nails, there's no bolts, everything is stitched together. And the only vessels that used this stitching technique were either Indian or Arab ships. And there was so much uh, exchange across the Arabian Gulf between the uh, Middle East and the west coast of India and crawling around to the east coast of India that from all the information we have, all the historic information, iconographic information, 
it's impossible to distinguish an Indian Dao from an Arab Dao. quickly afterwards. It was a reef 250 meters away from where the ship was lying. Uh, often ships that get stranded, they, one of the first things they do is they drop their anchor and then they drift away or the anchor's strung out in the end of a rope or a chain and we don't actually find it. And this is a very uh, unusual anchor. It's made up of various parts. This is wood down here. This is iron and from that form it's cast uh, wrought iron and this is a large disc to provide weight which is probably cast iron. The only only countries that actually produced cast iron at that time is China. Uh, but the wood later we identified was, was not from China and we actually found the, uh, a manuscript with an illustration where that anchor is very nicely depicted. You can actually see differences in color for the wood and the iron section. It's a grapnel type anchor. And that's the illustration of the whole. That's uh, the Harari script. It's uh, done in 1237 from memory, 1237. So it's quite a long time after our, our uh, shipwreck date, but traditions die hard in the maritime realm, and you can still see that all those planks are stitched. There's little tiny stitches drawn, drawn in there. Uh, it's a pretty fanciful illustration up here. You've got this rather large captain holding onto the ropes of his two oppositely filled sails. Uh, there's some bloke with an elephant trunk up there in the top of the mast, and there's a whole bunch of decapitated merchants sitting up here. <laughs> but interestingly, fellows like Marco Polo comment extensively on the, uh, the Arab stitch dow, and he's very critical. He says the things are leaking like sieves. Anyone's very lucky to reach their destination. Uh, and if you look down here, you've got two guys frantically bailing. They've got large jars full of water they're pouring out the side of the vessel. So that sort of uh, confirms uh, Apollo's observation. Now, at this time, you've got a transition going on. There's a, a rudder here, uh, which is it's actually a Chinese uh, invention. It may have occurred simultaneously in the Mediterranean, but uh, it would seem to be something that was developed by China first. But if you look carefully, there's also superimposed what we call a quarter rudder, and it's drawn onto that uh, that image, so it's like they were using two steering systems at once. Uh, to try and identify where the ship actually came from, we took a whole bunch of different uh, elements of the, the hull and we sent them for analysis to try and determine the timber species. And it turned out that the majority were this uh, Astelia, Afrikaans. So it came from Africa, it came from Northern Africa. Uh, we had one example of teak. The massive beams that crossed at deck level were teak. Uh, the things that I call the cargo trays, they were actually a pine, a juniper, could have come from China. So the fact that it, it's possibly from China, it's a removable part of the hull. It wasn't stitched in. There was no indication of how that was fastened to the hull. So they might have actually put that in at the place of lading and then put the cargo on top of it. At destination, it could have come out. There were square holes, sets of square holes at the end of each plank, which could have had a rope handle in for lifting in and out of the, the hole. But we have most of these timbers coming from Africa. The teak thing here is not a uh, conundrum at all. There's actually text describing teak from India and from the Maldives and coconut from the Maldives being exported to the Middle East to use for house and ship construction because they only had palm. Palm's useless for those things. Uh, it's not far to go. You go down the Nile, you can ship the timbers up the Nile and across to what are now Yemen and Oman and up into the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So through the timber analysis, we are able to conclude that the ship was in fact an Arab Dow, not an Indian ship. Uh, and in fact, we got enough information from the seabed, the, the amount of hull remains, even though they were highly degraded, uh, was enough to do a complete design of the vessel. The only thing that was missing on the seabed was half of the hull, but that's fine because the other half was replicated. We actually had timbers going right up to the gunwale. These are the through beams, those little squares. They still existed. The tail end of some of those were still there on the ship. The thing that we didn't have was this stern area 
So it's a bit of speculation that this was a vertical stern. That, that later drawing from the 13th century showed an angled stern, but uh, indications are that it was perhaps vertical, going on ethnographic information. The very fine keel was supplemented. This is called a keelson, so it's resting on top of the frames. That's much wider section, so all of your longitudinal strength, or a large part of it, is taken by that keelson, not just by the thin keel on its own. So we were able to do this plan to the point where uh, this gentleman, friend of mine, Nick Burningham, who also did a replica of the Borobudur ship years before and sailed it all the way down to Madagascar and beyond, uh, came up with this model. That's his model. He's, uh, he's obviously got time on his hands because he, <laughs> he hand-stitched it. Every single stitch there is done by hand. And part of the reason for doing this was because the Omani government very generously uh, offered to build a full-scale replica and gift it to Singapore. And he wanted to uh, go through the whole process of building the ship in small scale so they'd know some of the problems they'd run into by trying to do it on full scale. Uh, and that's what happened. They went across and they had a little launchway dedicated to building of this ship in Oman. They went to the extent of going down to Africa and sourcing exactly the right timber, the same timber that was used on the original. And then they ended up bringing in Indian craftsmen to do the stitching because none of the craftsmen were left in Oman at that time, or very hard to find. The Indians came in there and they taught some of the Omani shipwrights to do the stitching. But that would have occurred in the, in the ninth century. There was so much interaction. The Indians would have been in the Middle East and vice versa, building, trading, owning these, these type vessels. So they eventually uh, set sail. They sailed from Oman back to Singapore. They're quite capable of carrying on to China had they chosen to do so. Um, unassisted, there's no engine. There was no vessel traveling with them. And she performed exceptionally well. And she sort of copied that 13th century text. There's the quarter rudders, as are still used by the Indonesian Penisi. It's a Southeast Asian design, in fact. And there's also an axial rudder. So it was a bit of experimental uh, replica, experimental archaeology to see which one performed best. And it turned out that the quarter rudder performed better, and largely because the axial rudder had to be held on with ropes, and the ropes kept wearing through. So if you put an axial rudder there with iron pintles and gudgeons, as the European ships and later the Chinese used, uh, then the axial rudder is, is the better design. And she sailed all the way to Singapore. She was pulled out of the water. She hadn't leaked a drop, by the way, extremely robust, very different to the one that uh, Marco Polo observed, uh, with all modern facilities, such as the toilet hanging off the, the side. <laughs> and she is now residing inside the uh, Resorts World Experiential Museum, which just a week or two ago closed for renovation. Or, and we, we actually don't know what's going to become. I, I think this one, they, they left one of the walls off and wheeled it in and put it in its uh, pedestal and then built the wall. So I don't think they're going to remove that. I hope not. But there's also another very interesting cargo, which I'm about to discuss in the same museum. So Singapore has the whole collection in the Asian Civilization Museum, very nicely displayed. And they have the ship, the replica, which is an extremely accurate version of the original, as far as I'm concerned, sitting on Sentosa. So both parts are here, they're just separated. Uh, and that's the display in the ACM. So that's, that's well worth having a look at. It does emphasize uh, the pretty and valuable pieces, but it also has quite a lot of discussion on the, the things that were used by the crew and the less valuable trade goods. So the other wreck I'm going to discuss uh, is the other end of Tomasic. That's uh, in the early 15th century. It's actually uh, contemporary with Sung Ho's voyages. We found a coin on the wreck which is dated 1405 to 1424, I believe. Um, so it's just after the heyday of Tomasek, but as John has pointed out, it didn't just stop. So there's still trade going on. It's still a fiefdom of Malacca. There's still fleets operating from Tomasek. And this wreck is very different to the uh, the Belitong wreck, where the Belitong wreck had 60,000 pieces, they were all Chinese, so it loaded in China, that was coming down, possibly to trade elsewhere, it's still uh, speculation where it was finally headed. I tend to think it was headed to the Middle East, others tend to think it was headed to Java, where quite a few Changsha pieces have been found too. Uh, 
Uh, it was obviously lost off Belitung Island, which is closer to Sunda Strait and Java than it is to the Malacca Strait, which is the traditional route to and from the Middle East.